turn out this evening and truly international. You could hear from the accents from the beginning, we have people from Northern Ireland, from Gibraltar, from uh, across the world this evening. And that is a tremendous indication of the interest in the subject. I want to say a big thank you. Uh, my name is Stephen Jaffe, I'm from the Jewish community in Belfast. And a big thank you to History Hub Ulster, not just for this event uh, this evening, but actually it's one of a series of events you've had recently on various aspects of the Jewish community's history in Northern Ireland. Uh, and that is, I think, very much appreciated and very significant. Uh, I want to uh, introduce uh, both our speakers. I'm going to start with uh, Gordon McCoy, who's going to give the presentation this evening. Uh, Gordon is very well known in adult education circles, particularly uh, in Belfast. He is the Irish language education officer at the East Belfast Mission. Uh, Gordon has a, a doctorate in social anthropology from Queen's University in Belfast. He teaches the Irish language at various uh, levels. He also promotes bus tours, heritage trails, outreach to schools and uh, libraries, particularly in East Belfast. Now, as we're going to find out this evening, uh, Gordon is actually from the village of Saintfield. That's where he was born and he grew up. And as it happens, he was actually born and grew up on the very site of the evacuation centre at, at Saintfield. And he will share that story uh, with you. Before uh, Gordon speaks, I'm going to ask Fleur Hassan Nahum to say a few words, and we're very honoured to have Fleur with us uh, this evening. Fleur is the Deputy Mayor of Jerusalem. She has a particular responsibilities for the City of Jerusalem's international relations, economic development, uh, and also tourism and pilgrimages. Fleur is Gibraltarian by birth, a very proud Gibraltarian, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think Fleur is the only Gibraltarian to hold senior elected office outside of Gibraltar, uh, something which I know the Gibraltarian Jewish community is also very proud of. So Fleur, if I could hand over to you to please say a, a few words, thank you. Sure, good evening everybody. It's so lovely to see so many people and a lot of people that I know from the Jewish community of Gibraltar. And it's really wonderful. And I have to say, um, I, I, I got to know the story. I mean, I'm connected to the story of the evacuees uh, in Northern Ireland uh, in different angles. Uh, first of all, I was uh, in Northern Ireland about, I think it was two years ago, right, Stephen? And Stephen took me round and I gave a number of talks about Jerusalem. And in a few of the talks, uh, some people came up to me and said, wow, you're from Gibraltar. I have to tell you, we were friendly with the Gibraltarians who came and stayed here during the Second World War. And I mean, I, I kind of knew uh, what had happened to the evacuees, but I, I, I wasn't actually, I wasn't that connected to the story of Northern Ireland. I'd heard about Madeira and I'd heard about other stories, but less Northern Ireland. And uh, I think one of your historians lent me a book and I started looking into it and it was fascinating. And it was fascinating being in Northern Ireland and people were so friendly and so welcoming to me, uh, not just as a Gibraltarian, of course, but as an Israeli. And I felt very much at home. Um, and then, of course, the story is connected to me because my father's political career started with one very simple mission, that after the Second World War, he wanted to bring back the evacuees back home and repatriate them to Gibraltar. And so his entire career, my, my father, Sir Joshua Sand, his entire career started for one simple mission that is bringing his people back home. Uh, and, and of course, uh, the people, some of them who are on this Zoom were part of those people who are connected or have family members, people. So for me, this story uh, has a very close place in my heart, not just because I went and I saw and I met the people, but of course, it's the beginning of my father's political activism and career. And I, I think it's safe to say that he wouldn't have been a politician. I don't think I would have thought about it because it's tough. So, um, so it's really wonderful to, for this uh, event. Uh, you know, thank you so much for the organizers. Such a wonderful event, such a, a great connection between two wonderful communities, the Northern Ireland community, the Gibraltarians. 
And uh, thank you, Stephen, for always holding the flag for Israel and Northern Ireland. Uh, and a and, and, uh, wonderful historian that we're going to hear about, Gordon McCoy. So I hope we all have a, an interesting and, uh, and a fun, emotional evening. And thank you, and, and, and hi from Jerusalem. Shalom. Erev Tov. Mitzvah on Ireland. Erev. Welcome to Northern Ireland in three languages. I want to thank Stephen Jaff for encouraging me to give this talk and Gavin Bamford and the History Hub Ulster for facilitating it. I grew up in a prefabricated house, a mile away from St. Field, a small rural village. My home was one of many built after the war to solve the housing crisis in Northern Ireland. The houses were called the camps by locals, a reference to the site of a World War II camp nearby other prefabricated houses. I played in the ruins of a large hut with a corrugated iron roof. I walked on the nearby concrete paths and I went jogging on the old railway line. But I had no idea who lived in the camps. I imagined there were soldiers who were defending St. Field during the war, but they must have had a rather dull time as St. Field was never attacked. A stray reference in a cultural magazine opened my eyes. It referred to evacuees from Gibraltar who lived in St. Field during the war. This led to a frustrating search for the truth, which took me down various dead ends. And all my answers I found on Facebook. I found a site called Gibraltar Evacuation World War II. This put me in touch with Joe Gingell, an historian of the evacuation, who sent me some photographs of the camp in St. Field. I nearly fell off my chair when I looked at one of them. It showed an evacuee Rachel Beniso standing with a friend at a bridge. In the background were fields covered in snow. I recognised the fields immediately. This was the same bridge where I waited for the school bus every morning. The site was one of a number of emergency camps built in the winter of 1941-42. They were built after Belfast Blitz to house evacuees in the event of future bombings. However, there were no future bombings, so nobody stayed in them. How did people from Gibraltar come to the camps? At the outbreak of the war, it was feared that Franco would join the Axis powers. As such, Gibraltar was in terrible danger. Although this danger faded, the British discovered a German plan to attack Gibraltar. The war cabinet decided to fortify Gibraltar and to evacuate it of all personnel not employed by the military. In June 1940, 16,000 out of a population of 20,000 were evacuated to camps in French Morocco. A month later, Churchill ordered the destruction of the French fleet at Iran to prevent it falling into the hands of the Germans, who would use it to invade Britain, of course. 1,300 French sailors were killed and French Morocco turned against the Gibraltarians with their strong British identity. The camps were closed and the evacuees forced onto ships at gunpoint. They returned to Gibraltar only to be sent away again. They were scattered to Madeira, Jamaica and England. Many evacuees were accommodated in London and some stayed in luxury hotels. But the situation worsened when V1 bombs began to fall on the city. Six evacuees were among the casualties and a partial evacuation of London was ordered. Therefore, in July 1944, the Gibraltarians found themselves on the move again. 7,000 were sent to the relative safety of the emergency camps in Northern Ireland. The first group of 3,600 evacuees arrived on the 19th of July, 1944, and the Belfast Telegraph carried a rather florid account of their arrival. Dark-haired girls peered through open portholes, and there was one face in its encirclement of raven black hair that recalled the conception of an Italian master painter. Purple prose indeed. The second group of 3,100 evacuees arrived on the 24th of July, and a smaller group of 120 arrived on the 23rd of August. The evacuees travelled to 17 camps in Northern Ireland, which were organised in three clusters around Londonderry, Ballymena, and south of Belfast and County Down. The camps were all situated near rivers and were often called after the townlands in which they were built. The evacuees had to get used to such exotic names as Achachale, Morbul Shinney and Tawny Brack. 
In County Down, the camps were situated at rural locations at Carga, Cloch, Boscar and Saintfield. Later in 1944, a further camp was built at Cagdoff on the outskirts of Belfast. The Saintfield camp was in the townland of Las Drummond. The arrival of the evacuees in Saintfield was treated as a special occasion. Charlie Trebello remembers they were welcomed by Mr. Alfredo Balbin playing the bagpipe. The Belfast Telegraph noted that among the evacuees were 250 Jews in the care of ministers of their religion. The paper noted that Jewish evacuees carried with them a scroll of the laws which they have clung to in all their vicissitudes. They are from the Sephardic or Spanish Jews. The Irish News noted most of them are Roman Catholics but the party also includes 250 Jews. All have the jet black hair and sallow complexion of the Latin and many of the younger people are strikingly good looking. Sefford was the name these Jewish people had for the homeland in Portugal and Spain, where they established a distinctive Iberian Jewish culture. This came to an end in 1492, when Jews were offered the choice of conversion, expulsion or death. The loss of Spain was regarded by many Jewish historians as the greatest disaster to befall their people since the destruction of Jerusalem. In the 1700s, the British encouraged Jews to settle in Gibraltar in order to develop commerce and trade. At the time of the evacuation, there was a thriving Jewish community in Gibraltar with four synagogues. The religious customs of Sephardic Jews differed slightly from those of other Jews. After the expulsion from Spain, many lived in Morocco and were forbidden to have synagogues, so they developed a more informal style of worship in each other's homes. The Belfast community of Jews arrived from Eastern Europe around the end of the First World War. By the outbreak of the Second World War, many were second generation Jews who had been born and raised in Belfast. According to the 1937 census, the community numbered 1,470. All but 200 of them lived in North Belfast, where they had a synagogue and a Jewish institute, a fine building used for secular and cultural events. The 42 members of the Jewish Society at Queen's University an indication of the increasing professionalization of the community. The community was very active in the war effort, spurred on by their spiritual leader, the indomitable Rabbi Schachter. The community were involved in fundraising for many aspects of relief work, and in December 1942, this was recognized when the civil defense forces marched through Belfast. The Jewish wardens were given pride of place at the head of the parade. Other Jews arrived as refugees from Nazi-occupied Europe. The most well-known group was that of children who arrived with the help of the Kinder Transport. This organised the evacuation of unaccompanied Jewish children, many of whom were never to see their parents again. In 1938, two prominent Belfast Jews leased a 70-acre farm at Malile on the Ards Peninsula. A kibbutz was formed for the children, and over 300 Jewish adults and children stayed at this farm over a period of 10 years at different times. Locals taught the newcomers how to farm and to fish, and it was envisaged they would bring their skills to Israel at the end of the war. Other refugees from Europe were scattered all over Northern Ireland with all sorts of different occupations. The brothers Alfred and Isaac Utitz from Prague established a tannery in Trigley, which is about 10 miles from Saintfield. This prepared sheep and cattle hides for use in shoes, handbags and clothing. The locals were grateful as the area had suffered enormously from unemployment and poverty. Not only did the tannery employ many locals, but the brothers used it to secure work permits for their fellow Jews who were then able to escape from Nazi-occupied Europe. As for the Jewish evacuees from Gibraltar, many were sent to St. Field's Camp No. 4. This became known as the Jewish camp. Among them was Rachel Beniso, whom I interviewed, and who took many of the photographs of the camp. The St. Field camp was the home of Reverend Ben Zimra, who looked after the religious needs of the community there. As I understand it, Reverend is an unofficial title for someone who has had extensive religious training, but was not yet qualified as a rabbi. Nevertheless, a Reverend could conduct religious services. The St. Field Jews kept in close contact with the Belfast Jewish community 
and Rachel's father, Abraham Cohen, became a personal friend of Belfast Rabbi Schachter. Mrs. Benicio told me, you know who visited us also? The people from the Jewish center in Belfast, the Jewish boys and girls, they had a synagogue and a center and the young people used to come and visit us. I remember going out with some of the boys. We used to go on outings. The Gibraltarian Jews visited their counterparts in Belfast, as noted in a record of the community there. This is the note. On Wednesday of last week, they attended a special service at the synagogue, for which special transport was arranged. R.J. Schachter, who's been authorised by the government to look after the religious and general welfare of the evacuees, delivered a sermon, and the Reverend Ben Zimra joined the service. In total, over 325 Macrees lived at Camp Number 4, which is bounded on three sides by the River Glasswater, the Cumber to St. Peter Railway Line, and the Balagan Road. The evacuees were housed in 40 Nissen huts. The roofs are made of corrugated tin, floors are bare concrete, and heating was provided by pot bellied stoves fueled by coke. At the bottom of the site can be found the foundations and steps of a larger Nissen hut. This was the refectory or the dining hall where the evacuees sat at a long trestle table seat. Charlie Tavello remembers disliking the food intensely and wrote to me, the food not being to our liking, we baked our food and ate in the hut. The big hut was used as a recreation hall for dances, film shows, Christmas parties and concerts. These were attended by locals as well as evacuees. It was also used as a synagogue given the Jewish nature of the camp. The tables were simply pulled back for Sabbath services. Water was supplied from a well and a river via a water tower and treatment plant. The water tank was on a little red brick pot on the hill, which is still to be seen to this day. Sometimes the river was polluted by flax production, which made the water undrinkable. And at times water had to be brought to the camp from six miles away, which caused considerable trouble. Kitchens on the sick bay were to be found near the river. The present day business park at the bottom of the camp was the site of the camp kitchens. The business park has preserved other buildings. Former laundry or ablution centre has become the office for a small car company. There is also a little red brick hut which was once used as a cold meat store. The hut still has the original insulated door and the rails for the meat hooks are still inside. Locals were recruited as administrators, groundsmen, delivery drivers, nurses and cooks. The staff members who stayed in that site lived in better accommodation, either made of red bricks or concrete. Evacuees could collect letters and talk to the camp warden at the camp office. The evacuees were allowed to come and go as they please and could stay away for the night if they informed the camp warden beforehand. I visited the best preserved camp in Donaird and Antrim in 2013 and discovered the warden lived in better circumstances in the building with coat hooks, a fireplace and a bath. A Belfast Telegraph reporter visited a typical camp which I have identified as a simple one, and interviewed the warden at the end of July 1944. This is his report. The majority of the children spoke English and Spanish fluently and often filled the role of interpreter for the adults, some of whom could speak Spanish only. By way of entertainment, dances and concerts had been organised and the visitors had their own orchestra, he said. The farmer placed the field under a disposal for playing football, and there were other forms of healthy recreation available. The peculiarities of diet had given rise to some difficulty, but these were being overcome. A suggestion book placed in the dining hall at the camp had produced some useful hints from the evacuees as to what they liked and how they liked it cooked. One thing that was particularly pleased the evacuees was the plentiful supply of milk arranged through the Ministry of Agriculture. Unfortunately, the Nissen huts were hot in the summer and cold in the winter. They rusted easily and were in constant need of repair. They were also very gloomy, having been painted black inside for some reason. In the camps, the rising bell sounded at 7.30am and lights out was at 11pm. 
Only camp number 17 at Cardiff was fully electrified, being the Belfast grid. It also had running water and wooden floors, as it was a cut above the rest. It housed evacuees who worked in Belfast shipyards. The creme de la creme of the working aristocracy. In London, the evacuees had used private flush toilets. In the camps, toilets facilities were much more primitive, more public and unheated. Charlie Gibello wrote, we had no toilet in the huts and had to go a distance to a wooden chuck with a hole in the ground. Every camp had a primary school in which the children were taught by Gibraltarian and local volunteers. Some of the children went on to technical colleges or passed academic tests to attend some of the best high schools in Belfast, including Belfast Royal Academical Institution, Methodist College, and Victoria College of Girls. They often traveled to these schools on the back of trucks and took any accommodation that was made available. They felt that the education provided was superior to that available on their own. One beneficiary was Joshua Gabai, who attended Methodist College and after a successful career as a teacher, served in the Gibraltar Parliament for four years. His sister attended Victoria College. Joe Gingell writes of the Gabais, they were very pleased with the kind help they received and with the understanding attitude of the teachers towards the Gibraltar evacuees, many of whom had a struggle to catch up with the main subjects, mainly in English, owing to their many schooling interruptions in London during the war. One pressing problem in the camps was a lack of money. In London, the evacuees had been free to seek work, but in Northern Ireland, one had to have a residence permit, which one received after five years of living in Northern Ireland to get the right to work. As they had not paid social insurance contributions, the evacuees were not entitled to unemployment support or the dole. Instead, they were given a weekly allowance of, for example, 15 shillings and six pence a week for my couple, which is worth about 15 pounds today. The evacuees felt they had been rendered both poor and idle at one fell swoop. The ban on work was not strictly observed. The evacuees found work in the camps as cooks, cleaners and labourers on a rotational basis, so everyone had a chance to earn a little money. Rachel Benicio worked in the camp office distributing pocket money to other evacuees. Some of the St. Field evacuees may have worked in the tannery at Trigley. As a newspaper report mentions a leaving party for Gibraltarian workers. I'm certain that evacuees from Crossgar worked here as this was the closest camp. Some of the men found work in Belfast and in local farms, especially at harvest time. The local farms kept mostly cattle so the evacuees were in the land of milk, which was not rationed. And local farm produce was a way to top up the rations. One evacuee, Elias Benjo, remembers that evacuee children pinched eggs from a local farm in St. Field. They also gathered wild fruit from the railway line. These would have been rose hips and blackberries important sources of vitamin C during the war. This was a dangerous pastime as trains could suddenly pass. The summer of 1944 represented a brief honeymoon period during which the evacuees were glad of their peaceful surroundings and good weather. They were townspeople enjoying the novelty of living in the countryside for the first time. Charlie Tobello noted, one of the things that impressed me very much as a child was the cattle fair held in St. Field Village. We Gibraltarian were not used to seeing so many cattle before the evacuation. The Gibraltarians were told that they would return to their homes in monthly sailings. And one month after their arrival, 400 evacuees from a Balamina camp boarded a vessel to return to the rock. The Belfast Telegraph noted that one elderly gentleman took a slip of a pink rambling rose saying, it will remind me of the people here. My sons are working in a dockyard in Gibraltar. 
Those with relatives in Gibraltar who had accommodation for them were lucky in that they were allowed to return early. Rachel Beniso did not stay in St. Pete for long because she had an uncle in Gibraltar who vouched for her and she was able to return ahead most of the rest. In, by 1944, the sailings had stalled and the honeymoon was well and truly over. A correspondent for the London Times visited the Seafield camp and painted a very bleak picture. They complained bitterly of the cold and of their small allowances, the primitive sanitary conditions and lack of central amenities. Many of the evacuees were not too badly clothed, but all are finding that the present living conditions are very severe in clothing, especially shoes. The Women's Voluntary Service, who have a representative at each camp, assist the most needy with gifts of clothes and footwear. But the supplies are said to be far from adequate. The children have their own camp school, and those of suitable age free receive free education in secondary and technical colleges in Belfast and other towns. There is an unattractive, although well-equipped, sick bay, and a doctor attends daily. Health at the camp is good, and there have been few reports of sickness. Cooking is done in a communal kitchen, and each person receives rations similar to those available to residents in this country. Each Nissen hut is divided into two small compartments and furnished with a table, one or two wooden chairs, and two or three beds not greatly superior to camp beds, according to the number of occupants. No carpet or boards cover the damp concrete floors. A stove and oil lamp supply heat and light. The camp toilet, which consists of 20 cold water taps pouring into large wooden troughs, is unheated and totally unsuitable for women. At present, there's no electricity supply in the camp, but electric light will shortly be installed in the dining rooms, kitchens and recreation rooms of all centres. It will not be installed in the living quarters where it is needed most. That's the end of the report. The mud which accompanied the Irish autumn was the first problem to affect the evacuees, especially as many of the camps did not have paths. The evacuees had a protest until they were provided with them, and there are more protests on the way. The mood soured further when the evacuees realised that they would not be repatriated before the camps endured the first Irish winter. While the children enjoyed playing in the snow for the first time, the adults did not appreciate the novelty for long. In November 1944, Miss Florence Horsbrough, the Parliamentary Secretary of the British Ministry of Health, visited two camps in County Down and two in County Antrim. The Down recorder noted her nerve-testing experience. A surprise waited her in the first camp. To wit, slogans painted on the walls and roofs of the Nissen huts. A surprise awaited her at the first camp. To wit, slogans painted on the walls and roofs of the Nissen hut. Back to jail. We want to go home. Not only so, placards bearing similar messages were banished by men and women, who, while appreciative of the hospitality extended to them, flinched at the thought of spending the winter here. Photographs of the St. Field camp show the slogans, Back to the Rock, and We Want Our Country, It's Time We Were Back. In Westminster, Sir Hugh O'Neill of Antrim pressed the issue and was told by the Minister of Health that it was not possible to send the evacuees back to Gibraltar more quickly due to the housing conditions there, but also in a minor degree due to the lack of transport. Hugh O'Neill even suggested that the evacuees be sent to North Africa, where it was warmer. He was told that North Africa was not controlled by His Majesty's government. For her part, later Lady Sylvia O'Neill wrote withering letters to the papers. One published in the London Times in December 1944 pulled no punches. They came in July, and rightly or wrongly, were convinced that they would only be here for a short time on their way home. The camps are quite unsuitable for people used to a warm climate. At present they are seas of mud. During the harvest time some of the men were employed, but the Gibraltarian is not an agricultural worker. 
Theoretically, the Jibbo Trains are at liberty to leave the camps, but as residence permits are needed for strangers living in Northern Ireland, and they are not granted to the Jibbo Terrians, these people are to all intents and purposes in concentration camps. The winter of 1947 brought freezing Arctic winds and heavy snow to Northern Ireland. Locals had been accustomed to a couple of weeks' snow. In 1947, they had three months of it. Herds of cattle froze to death, the railway stopped, and entire communities were cut off by weeks at a time. One can only imagine the effect on the evacuees. At least by then, 5,000 had returned to Gibraltar, leaving 2,000 behind. Despite their problems, the Gibraltar trains found many ways to occupy their times and to raise their spirits. Rachel Benicio remembers borrowing a bicycle to explore the local country lanes, as well as getting lifts to Belfast and delivery vehicles to have tea with their friends. The evacuees were very musical people, fond of singing and playing instruments. A local from Crossgar, five miles from the Sinku camp, told me the Spanish guitar had shown anything the locals could produce. There are many reports of concerts which gathered evacuees from the various camps. Performers often made their own costumes for those events. Reports of the concerts, craft competitions and other events were carried in the Camp Courier, a magazine for the evacuees. The secretary of the camp clubs, Louis Castro, lived at the St. Louis camp. Clubs taught the girls needlecraft and the boys learned woodwork to a high degree. A rich source of information on the camp is to be found in the Sainfield Court Reports of the Down Recorder. One 1946 account attests to the Jewish nature of the camp. The catering manager, Bernard Becker, and a visiting lady friend, Doris Hawk, were suspected of pocketing food, matches, and, so and soap intended for the evacuees. Becker was caught with food and soap when his car was intercepted by the police at Caradoc. Becker claimed to have bought the items in Belfast and Saintfield. Unfortunately for Becker, the hall included kosher margarine as identified by the evacuee, Abraham Cohen. The soap was also incriminating as it was similar to that manufactured for use in the camps. In another case, Esther Gabai was charged with making a coat out of a blanket, but the magistrate dismissed the case as it could not be proven that Gabai was unaware the blanket did not belong to her, but belonged to the Ministry of Health. Locals remarked on the differences between themselves and the Gibraltarians. I've encountered reports of evacuees playing football with their bare feet, but this is more likely to be due to a lack of uh, footwear. Mr. David Pettigrew told me there are all sorts of rumours about the exotic foodstuffs of the evacuees, including garlic and horses. Horses were definitely not kosher, and local people knew that French people had horses, so they assumed all foreigners did the same. I remember uh, locals talking about the evacuees' darker, darker skin, which was some described as, as tanned or swarthy. One local told me about Ernie Whiteside, a local character and a keep fit fanatic who challenged passers by to a boxing match. When he invited some passing evacuees, to join him in a match, he was thrashed by a lightweight champion for his trouble. Boxing was a popular sport in Gibraltar, and the evacuees even had a boxing club in Northern Ireland. The locals must have been bemused by the strong British identity of these Gibraltarian Catholics, given the Irish nationalist attitudes of the local Catholics. I have noticed that in local newspaper reports, the Catholic nationalist papers concentrate on the religion of the evacuees, whereas the Protestant Unionist ones tend to comment favorably on their British identity. The evacuees have something to please everyone. Rachel Benicio remembers making friends with local girls who worked in the camp, while her mother made friends in St. Pete. Rachel told me, no one looked down on us or anything like that. Charlie Tobello remembers relations with the St. Pete people were very good indeed, and recalls invitations by Mrs. Coulter to visit her farm for dinner on many occasions. 
There's other evidence of close relationships between locals and evacuees. One court report concerns an assault by Daniel Gabay on Isaac Israel on New Year's Day, 1945. The report goes, according to the evidence, at a hop in Saintfield Courthouse on the 1st of January, despite a warning to lay off, Israel danced three times with Peter Simpson, the ballet operative, who had arrived with Gabon. Result, Israel was knocked senseless and had afterwards to be tended in the sick bay by Sister McKenna at the nearby camp. The gratitude of some evacuees was expressed in the Irish names they gave their children who were born in Northern Ireland. The Down recorder noted that one ship sailed for Gibraltar with two young Patricks on board. There were examples of local sympathy for the evacuees who found the Northern Irish welcome to be warmer than that of London. Rachel Beniso and other evacuees were invited by the Armitage Moors to visit Rowan House which is now a National Trust property, very well known for its attractive gardens. The note of the visit from Gibraltar recorded a visit to Lord and Lady Moore in a manor house. Now the Armitage Moors were not titled gentry, but I'm given to understand that they would have been pleased to be considered as such. In March 1946, young evacuees in St. Louis were given a special treat when they were among the 200 Gibraltarian children who travelled to Cumber five miles away to see Princess Elizabeth, where she stood godmother to the daughter of Lieutenant Commander James Osborne King. The Belfast Telegraph reported, the royal car was stopped and a bouquet of flowers was presented to the princess by Miss Yvonne Aberdeen on behalf of the Gibraltarians. Her Royal Highness in reply said, thank you, this is very kind of the Gibraltarians. Aberdeen is a Jewish name. By the autumn of 1944, Gibraltar was no longer in danger, but many Gibraltarians found themselves stranded in Northern Ireland as there was a shortage of accommodation on the rock. As well as that, there was a shortage of educational and medical facilities. In January 1946, 3,059 evacuees were still in Northern Ireland. By January 1947, the number was 1,019. After the war ended in 1945, the Down Recorder was filled with reports of new developments and exciting events. The electrification program and the opening of Butlin's holiday camp in Mosney, County Meath. But still the Gibraltarians languished in the camps, a reminder of a war which locals were trying to put past them. The stormed authorities pleaded with the colonial office to move the evacuees back to England, where they could find employment and better accommodation. However, there was an acute accommodation uh, in England, especially for hospitals or any temporary accommodation. One official communication I read suggested that the only accommodation available in Britain was in prisons. The Northern Irish government blamed the British authorities for not helping them by accommodating the evacuees. In turn, the authorities in England blamed those in Gibraltar for the delays in the repatriation programme. I have no definite date for the closure of the St. Pete camp, but I believe it was quite late. The last camp to be closed was Camp Number 17, or the Kaidov Camp, which was shut on the July 31st, 1948. This is the official date for the end of the evacuation in Northern Ireland. After the Gibraltarians left St. Pete, locals squatted in the camp, including a former neighbour of mine, Mrs. Ward, as there was a severe shortage of housing in the district. In 1948, the Armstrong family bought the campsite and turned it into a poultry farm. The chickens were housed in Lisbon huts. After the poultry farm was closed, the Lisbon huts were sold. Unlike Ballymena, there seems to be little effort to preserve what is left of the County Down camps. The Crossgar camp was demolished to build a school, and two red brick huts 
are all that is left of the club and card accounts. A large house has recently been built on the St. Field site. The evacuation has had lasting consequences for the politics of Gibraltar. The Gibraltarians resented being removed from their homes and considered themselves to be evacuees, not refugees, because they had no choice in going. The grievances of the people during wartime led to the creation of the Association for the Advancement of Civil Rights in 1942, which campaigned for the speedy return of the evacuees. This led to a desire for more self-government. Tommy Finlayson's account of the evacuation noted, no longer were the decisions of the colonial government accepted without question. The Gibraltarians had learned well the workings of British democracy. Perhaps it is no wonder that the title of Finlayson's book is The Fortress Came First. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I mean, what a fantastic uh, presentation. And uh, Gordon, I think, you know, this story was in danger of being lost, lost when the generation who lived in the camps passed away. I mean, you've ensured through your research of local newspapers, uh, the reminiscences that you gathered from people, the official sources that you've looked at, you've ensured that this story is going to survive. And it is such an important story, both for the people who, who lived on the camps, for the communities uh, around about them uh, today in, in Northern Ireland. And it's, you know, you brought out the difficulties that the people there faced uh, through the weather, through wanting to get back home. It wasn't uh, by any stretch uh, just a, a, a good news story. There was a lot of hardship there. Uh, but thank you so much for, for what you've done. I mean, the only point that I, I wanted to add is that I know that sadly uh, some of the uh, evacuees actually passed away in Northern Ireland in the yeah. cemetery uh, outside Belfast. I think there are four graves uh, to Gibraltarians uh, who very sadly died uh, while they were uh, in Northern Ireland. The name of one of them I can remember offhand was a lady called Lea Parente. Mm. And I think at least three three others uh, buried there. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to go and visit that Cormoni Cemetery and have a look at those. And, and some local Jewish people have said to me they they found some strange names in the Carmoni Cemetery. They're wondering why they were there. Um, they obviously were different surnames from the ones they were used to. And so some didn't even know the story themselves of the Gibraltarians um, as well. So, um, yeah, it's, 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 it, it was, and the thing was at the time people during the war, they recognised that there'd be a lot of strangers about. There was the British Army in St. Fields. There were lots of people moving around. And they were children at the time, and they took the, the refugees or the evacuees uh, for granted. You know, children do that sort of thing. And um, so they just remember them walking around and things like that. It was, it was difficult to get information from the locals a lot because they were children at the time, and they just they didn't pay any great, great attention to them.